Anybody know anything about who's leading the music or anything? No. Steve? You gonna do it? <laughs> no? Do we want to sing some praise songs or we just want to sing? Joe, do you want to lead us in, in a song or two? Maybe just out of the Do you not have a, a disc? I right. Okay, well, whatever we're doing for praise songs.
Luke 17, 11 to 19. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. As he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And he lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where am I? Where are the nine? They are not found that return. They there are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto them, Arise, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And Paul May will be bringing us the morning message. Circumstances is kind of a little sad story as well. Sorry to hear about Donna. That was uh, quite a shocker, I imagine, as much to you as it was to me as well. But I'm sure your new interim pastor, uh, John Houston, I'm sure. I never met the individual, I'm not familiar, but uh, I'm sure he'll do a great job for you as well. I'm sure it was, it was quite a long process, I guess, you had to have uh, selected another pastor to fill in anyways, because I know Donna was planning on leaving, but not under these circumstances anyways. So. Let us go to the word, uh, to, to the Lord in a word of prayer before we start this morning. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this time that we can spend together. We thank you for the fellowship that we have with one another here. We also thank you for our salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, who paid the ultimate price to forgive us for our sins, that we may have eternal life with him as we look forward to that time when he'll come again. Father, we just ask for, for your leading and your guidance. We ask for the Holy Spirit as he opens our hearts and minds here this morning to your word. Help us to see the things that we need to change in our life, Father, to conform more into the image of Christ, so we can take that message to a lost and dying world. And it's in His name I pray. Amen. One of the things that we looked at here this morning, that you already read, I'll, I'll probably read that again, is. As you, if you look there in Luke chapter 17, you'll see that now Jesus, uh, we're walking here with Jesus at this section of the Gospel of Luke towards Jerusalem at this particular time. And for many months, I guess I'll be in these. <laughs> I had these worked on, but still need these sometimes. For many months, Jesus had crisscrossed uh, Israel, preaching the gospel for the kingdom, doing many miracles and healings. He was casting out demons, speaking about judgment and hell and punishment, proclaiming the full counsel of God to awaken the people of Israel to the necessity of looking to him as their savior and redeemer. And it's actually during this period of time of Jesus' journey, which really began back in chapter 9 of Luke, that he'll make that arrival here in chapter 19. But here's the miracle that involves 10 people with the most terrible disease, and that's the disease here of leprosy. As we read that, that he, as he was on his way, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee, and he entered a village with 10 leprous people, and they raised their voices. And the thing is, they raised their voices, it was like, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And he showed them. He said, just go and show yourself to the priest and you're going to be healed. And they were cleansed. And the thing about it was one of them was a Samaritan. We'll get to that part of the story a little bit later. And this is this is a demonstration really of divine power. And that's unmistakable here. And I might add, as a footnote, footnote never 
did the Jewish people or the leaders ever deny the, the, the miracle power of Jesus? Never. You can never find out in Scripture. They never denied his power. There was absolutely no way that they could. Nor could they deny his compassion and his sympathy uh, toward those who suffered. And in Christ, God was manifesting his compassion as much as his power because the miracle that Jesus did were miracles of mercy on people who suffered. Jesus demonstrates compassion here. And, undo, and he undoes what the people would have assumed would be a divine curse. As you, as you learn through the gospel record, the people had the idea that sickness came as a result of sin. And the leprosy of all things was viewed as a divine judgment. And so here's Jesus. He's compassionate and overturning divine judgment. And he had this stunning miracle by all, of all perspectives. And this is such a serious and communicable disease that the Old Testament made prescriptions about people who had it. And since they were responsible to know the law of God and apply the law, and since, they, and since this was laid out in the law of God, if you had a skin disease of any kind, you went to the priest and went through a process of all that was required so there could be no determination, so there could be a determination as to exactly of what you had. And if it's discovered, that you had a communicable disease called leprosy. You were then removed from any social contact. And the only people that you could ever associate with were other lepers. You could associate with any other people in the law, in the synagogue, where you have any social environment whatsoever. So it's sort of like we're going through a little bit now, doesn't it? But we don't have leprosy, but anyways. I mean, you were just alienated from all life and left only with, with, this, with the same people that had the same misery. And so these were the most miserable, really, of all people. And believe it, they had been cursed by God and cursed by man as well, religiously and socially defiled in every way. I mean, they had no family, they had no job, they had no friends, no worship, and no hope. They were just walking illustrations of sin. They were walking illustrations of divine judgment. I mean, little wonder that when Jesus came to their village, they cried out to him collectively, and they're all healed. It's an astounding, astounding scene and incredible healing from all human viewpoints. Now, as we look at this story here, we're going to see divine goodness and tenderness. We're going to see compassion and mercy. And we're going to see the divine power to, to, to reverse that disease, to bring it to a screeching halt and fully restore 10 people to their whole condition again, as in the case of all Jesus' miracles. And they were all, they were instantaneously, and they were complete. Shocking as it may be, as you learn in the story here, it's also an astounding story of people being that have that are in gratitude, unthankfulness. More importantly, it's also a story about people that it's about a person who has gratitude and they, they worship and also salvation. So, so if you have your Bible still open there, at verse 11 we'll start there. It says, it came about that we, as he was on his way to Jerusalem. Now this was sometime during his journey through Israel. In the final months, really, as Jesus was preaching the gospel, he was, yeah, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. So he just entered this certain village, which he did week after week, and he was preaching the gospel, and the king of the kingdom demonstrated his compassion and his power through the miraculous. It tells us there in verse 11 that ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And that, that little phrase there, at a distance, indicates that their disease was the real leprosy, not some other skin disease. And they kept their distance because it was demanded of them in the Old Testament according to Leviticus chapter 13 and Numbers chapter 5 and Numbers chapter 12. 
Rav Shinda came to us that they had to keep his distance, so they only came as close as they dared to come. So it says there in verse 13, they raised their voices. I guess they raised the, sort of a feeble voice. And it's saying sort of a strange choral discord. Uh, the sound saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Sort of like they were gasping. Because leprosy affected the vocal cords a lot. Of all the words they've chosen, they chose that word master. It's kind of an interesting word. In fact, in the Greek, it's used only by Luke. And it's only used here to refer to Christ, but none other than all of his, than his followers. In fact, it's a word that speaks of someone who has notable authority or has power, even miraculous power. And that's why it's used to apply to Jesus. So here these men are borrowing a word that affirms, they recognize the authority and the power here of Jesus. Let's put it this way, they knew his reputation. I mean, this was their only hope. There was, this was their only choice. They had no way out of, out of their dilemma. There was no cures. There was no other solutions. Their fate may be meager, but they're desperate men. What other options do they have? And so they say, have mercy on us. That's a phrase that recognizes that, 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 this, that these people are in a very pitiful condition. And the one that's un, they're, they're one that's unable to solve a problem. That one is in a dilemma about which he can do nothing. He must depend on a superior power. And that's why they ask for mercy. Have mercy on us. And that's just, a, that's just a common expression. So verse 14, he says, And when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourself to the priest. Now that seems like a very strange thing to say. Why didn't he say, just be healed? Why didn't he say, go show yourself to the priest? Because Jesus is doing a couple of things here. He's testing their faith, for one. It may have been just a need of faith, but anyways. But this is a good test. But he's also affirming the viability of the divine law. Jesus knew the Old Testament law, and he's upholding that law. Because leprosy required that. I mean, you wouldn't go anywhere near the priest if you still had leprosy. You'd be going to the health inspectors with your disease. But Jesus commands them to do it, to fulfill the obligation of the law, and they did it. You know, that's what desperation will do also for us. Do they have faith? Sure they have faith. They have a meager, basic faith in a healer, and they have faith in the power and also the compassion of Jesus because it says there in verse 14, it came about as they were going, they were cleansed. You know, one of the things that <laughs> kind of stuns me every time when you, uh, when you see, read, read a story of a miracle is the understatement here of it. You would expect something like this, maybe. And then the sky grew black, and they began to thunder, and lightning bolts flashed, and angels began to sing, and Jesus said, be healed, and the earth shook. <laughs> but that doesn't happen, does it? There's no fanfare. There's no hoopla. They just start walking. They're made new, and they're healed. God is no respecter, folks, of persons, not even the most loathsome leper that was beyond the reach of his divine love. And that goes for anyone here this morning that doesn't know Christ as their Savior. There is no sin that he cannot forgive. Well, this was just in the normal course of being God. And they knew that they had to have the healing verified uh, because Leviticus chapter 14 even describes uh, what you do when it's verified. You have ceremonies and washings and sacrifices and all those kinds of things. And lepers are touched in certain places. And it's a huge thing that somebody is being certified they're cleansed from leprosy. That was a big thing back then. 
And here come ten lepers, and they're going to have to validate this healing. And so they're going to have to become very reluctant, very unwilling witnesses to the compassion and the power of Jesus. But they're also going to be very clear eyewitnesses to the fact that Jesus overruled any assumption that these men are cursed by God. The thing about it is the priests too would be forced to confirm the supernatural power of Jesus. It also forces them to confirm his deity as well as is, is, as is the adherence to the law. So they became reluctant witnesses to his deity. And when the men arrived and went through this whole process and the priests would have to validate that publicly. Well, that part of it really isn't in the story, but that's what, what has to take place. And these lepers, they, they, believed, they were believing in his healing powers, and they were desperate, and they obeyed, knowing that he had clearly demonstrated uh, that power here in Israel. They really had no other option. As, as they were going, they were cleansed. Were they cleansed because they believed? Well, they basically he they were basically healed because Jesus chose to heal them, but it also involved their faith in it. There were times when Jesus healed people because they believed. There were many times when he, he, he healed people who didn't believe. In fact, there were times when he raised dead people and they couldn't believe. So there were times when faith played a role and times when it did. But in this case, Jesus asked them to show enough faith to do what he said. Now all of them started toward the priest, didn't it? They all received a healing, but then the camaraderie was broken. Because it tells us here in verse 15, it says, Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back. One of them, when he saw that he, he was healed, he turned back. Only one. He stopped here in his tracks. He turned around, came back. He was full of joy, full of amazement, and full of wonder. He's just trying to process what, is, uh, what this meant. Think about all the implications now of being able to go back to your family, go back to your friends. He understood the real implications of what had just happened. And what is that? He's been in the presence here of God, and he wanted more than just physical healing. He went back embracing the full potential of getting from God what he really needed. His heart was longing here now for a relationship with the divine healer. He wanted to fall on his face beneath the divine healer as, as a recognized sinner and worship and adore him and as well as praise him and even thank him. He wanted something more than just the physical healing because he knew enough about the Old Testament to know that God wasn't just a healer, but also a redeemer and a savior. He could, he's not content with just the physical. He understands the reality of his alienation and his need for reconciliation to God. So he comes back at the end of verse 15 and says, glorifying God with a loud voice. Perhaps it's a voice that was not able to do what it hasn't been able to do for years. Yeah, he didn't have any more of a squeaky, raspy, affected larynx anymore. Now he could cry out with new vocal cords. This is just a big, loud voice. This is sort of Luke's way of expressing the idea of great emotion. He just burst out in a loud voice. He comes back at the top of his lungs, just glorifying God. Meaning he knew where the power had come from. He knew who had healed him. And he knew Jesus was more than just a mere man because he doesn't just glorify God. Because verse 16 says he fell on his face, at his feet, and he worshipped him. And he knew. In fact, they all knew, Samaritan and Jew, that God and God alone is to be worshipped. 
In giving thanks to him, he knew that it wasn't God and Jesus that had given him this gift. He couldn't restrain his praise. He couldn't restrain his worship. He couldn't even restrain his thanks. But his foster is there saying, I want a relationship with you. I want everything you have to give. Because he knew he was in the presence of God. Kind of an interesting way to look at that, isn't it? So what are the other nine guys doing? Well, they're moving toward the priest. Probably with this view in mind that they were going to go to the temple because you only have to go there to make the sacrifice that will require one who's been cleansed. But the thing is, God doesn't dwell in that temple. If you remember from the Gospel of the Records, Ichabod was written on that temple long ago when the glory departed. And that's why Jesus said in John chapter 4, the time is coming when you won't worship God in Jerusalem or in Mount Gerizim because you're going to worship God in spirit and in truth and you're going to worship Him from the heart. But most significantly, this man knew where to worship God and where God really dwelt. He goes back to the true temple of God. He recognizes that whenever the compassion and the power and the grace of God is, that it, that's where God is. Jesus is the true temple. And God doesn't dwell in Jerusalem. He dwells in Jesus, and this man knows it. And he also knows that God offers more than just the physical healing. This isn't, this isn't the real issue in his life. That's only a temporal detail. He returns not just to be thankful for a healing, he returns to seek what his soul really desired and needed, and that's salvation. How do I know that? Because that's exactly what Jesus gave him. And here's the punchline. And he was a Samaritan. Ooh, man, that was a crawl. That was a burr under the saddle for the Jews. The least likely for the Jewish view, viewpoint to be healed, he was an outcast. And the only reason he could associate with these other Jews was all was because they all had leprosy. They were all lepers. And their common misery made for a normal social separation. Surely no one would expect God to heal a Samaritan, but God did heal one. And this man knows that God isn't like the people that he's used to. He knows that God is a Savior and a Redeemer, and he comes back and he worships. So verse 17, Jesus just answered and said to him, he said, and here he gives us three rhetorical questions here. To sort of drive home an important point of ingratitude and indifference. He says, were there not ten cleansed? Well, the structure in our Bibles, by the way, expects kind of a positive answer. Were there not ten cleansed? Well, they were, there were ten cleansed, were they? I mean, they all were cleansed. That would be another way to say that. And then Jesus asked the second rhetorical question, but the nine, where, where are they? The where is sort of a blast and a sort of a punctuation point place of primacy here. In other words, it would read like this in the original, but the nine, they are where? They ought to be here, isn't it? They're where? There's no answer. Presuming they're on their way to the priest, they don't have any interest in Jesus now anymore. They got what they wanted out of him. They're very shallow, very superficial. They have no desire to worship him, no desire to glorify him, and no desire even to thank him. They don't see him as God. They don't fall down and give to Jesus what we only give to God. And again, we're face to face with this dominant attitude among these people that we see all through the ministry of Jesus. We're the chosen people of God. And God gives us what we deserve. That's their attitude. They're sort of like that rich young ruler. 
No sense of remorse. No sense of desperation. They're not looking for a savior from sin. They're looking for a political Messiah. And they're looking for somebody who will feed them free food. They're looking for somebody who will heal all their diseases. They'll take, what, they'll take all that, but don't want anything else. You know, folks, we've got a lot of people like that in the evangelical world today who's offering that kind of Jesus. There are people who only come to church with that kind of an attitude. Well, this one man knew that he needed a Savior. He knew that he had come face to face with God and his soul here was traumatized. He knew he was a sinner, but he knew that God had shown him mercy, had shown him compassion and kindness, and also showed him power. He could process the implications of what just, what just happened. The others, they were just hard-hearted, weren't they? Satisfied nothing more than with themselves. They sought, them, they sought nothing more from Jesus. And you know the sad thing is, Jesus doesn't have anything to offer us on a permanent basis unless it's eternal life and salvation. We don't come to him for that. We kind of cheat ourselves out of whatever he really came to bring. And then Jesus asked this third rhetorical question. In verse 18, he says, Was no one found who turned back to give God glory to God except this foreigner? By the way, the word foreigner in the Greek is, very, is a very strong word. Nobody came back except this man of another race. By the way, the word foreigner was really, it was really written on the outer wall of the temple, forbidding any foreigner uh, from access to the temple precepts. The area is only allowed for the Jews. I mean, there was a court of the Gentiles, but they couldn't go anywhere beyond that. He's the foreigner. He's outside the covenant. He's outside the people of God. He's outside the promises. He's outside the adoption. He couldn't get near the inner court, the Holy of Holies. But he fell on his face before the Holy One himself and worshiped in humility and joy. And the thing about it is the other nine just walked away to their dead, cold, blind religion with no more interest in Jesus at all. So verse, verse 19, this sort of reaches the end of the story. And he said to him, Rise, go your way, fulfill the law, go back to the priest, your faith has saved you. Well, the angels is sort of misleading a little bit. Many translations says, uh, say this, they has made you well. Everybody was made well. I mean, all ten were made well, and that's not the definitive ending to the story. The verb isn't the word for heal, and it's not the word for cleanse, it's the word for salvation. In the Gospels, it's used for that. In the Epistles, it's the word for saved and salvation. It's translated that way. And, excuse me. And here's the very obvious. And here, here is very obvious that this man had come back, and he has come back penitently, worshipfully, and the Lord has healed his soul and given him salvation. It should be translated as it is in Luke chapter 7, verse 50. Your faith has saved you. And this refers to the second miracle for this man. Not only was he healed from leprosy, but his faith has also saved him. He has salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the point of all this? Well, there's a big point here. Big picture. <laughs> this man's trust and his gratitude and his humility and his commitment and his love and his praise, and his worship. All components of a faith that's way beyond the other nine, right? It's a faith that embraces Jesus as God and as Lord. It's a faith that bows humbly in recognition of one's lowliness in his presence. It's a faith that Jesus says saves. But it's not just the story of an individual. It's a parable. And we can't really help look at the other nine and see they're, they're representative of the general attitude toward Jesus. 
Give us healing. Give us food. Deliver us from demons. Do miracles, but don't expect worship. Don't expect praise. Don't expect adoration or even thanks. Don't expect us to acknowledge you as God. But this foreigner fell down glorifying God. And he knew God was the source of his miracle. And he thanked Jesus and he worshiped him. He came back with the right attitude. So will the ungrateful nine illustrate the general attitude of the Jews? That is, we'll take everything you give. We'll take all the benefits. We'll take all the miracles. But don't expect worship. This one Samaritan is a picture of the outcasts who believe. It might be the Jews for the tax collectors and the sinners. You know, the riffraff, the scum, the thugs, the lowlifes, the prostitutes who surrounded Jesus, of whom he said he come to call the sinners and not the righteous. Everybody heard the message. Everybody enjoyed the benefit of Jesus' power. I mean, everybody basked in the wonder here of his teaching, his miracles, but only a few came and fell at his feet. They glorified him as God and worshipped him and humbled themselves and offered him thanks. The majority were just the takers. The small group were the ones who gave him the worship. The majority were content with just fixing up their life a little bit. Just superficial, you know, just temporal. The small group wanted him to change their soul and transfer, transform their hearts. Well, the warning here is that we can expect the goodness and the common grace of God. And we do. I mean, the whole world does. I mean, doesn't he make the, the sun to rise of all of us? the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He's good to all men. And we can be blessed by God in an earthly, physical way. We can even be blessed to hear the stories of Jesus and the gospel truth. And we can say, I'll take what I get. I'll take my life and I'll like it the way it is. It's okay, God, give it to me. I thank God for it. I mean, you often hear people say that, don't we? Thank God that I'm healthy, or, or thank God that I have children, or thank God for my job. We I mean, just go on and on. And we can walk right away, right away into eternal hell. Or we can come back and fall on our face before Jesus Christ and embrace Him as our Savior and Lord. And the miracle that He did for these people, the thing is, He'll do it also for us today. You know, gratitude doesn't grow well in the crusty soil of pride. For a thankful spirit to blossom, we must cultivate humility really in our hearts. And to do that, we must see ourselves accurately. And the thing about this, this parable here is that Luke holds before us a mirror, the story of these ten lepers. The thing is, we're the lepers. We're standing out of distance. We're wearing the filthy rags of our works. We try to conceal the disease of sin that's slowly consuming our flesh. But Christ sees us as we are. We're unclean. We're ostracized. And we're dying. Without Christ, what will happen to us in our state of sin? Was just putting ourselves inside the story of the tents of these ten lepers kind of stir a spirit of thanksgiving in our hearts. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks. That means in every circumstance, in every situation. And that gets hard to do sometimes, doesn't it? Paul said in Philippians 4.11, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. Boy, that's putting the rubber on the road, isn't it? You know, in the midst of this Corbin 19, 19 virus, it has revealed what and who people really, truly love. It does. You know, with our daily life temporarily stripped of some of its comforts and some of the distractions and the entertainment and the, and the freedoms that we have been given, a rare glimpse of our own hearts. 
this is what do we cherish? What do we fear? Where do we place our affection? Where do we place our trust? And where do we even place our hope? The question that comes to mind is, are we really thankful? At such a time as this, real thankfulness might be just the turning point we need. God will make all things work together for God, for good. I mean, nothing that God does is unplanned. He's not up there when this virus broke out and called a committee meeting and said, now what are we going to do? It doesn't work that way. We all need to be thankful in all things to really recognize that the hand of God, in, hand of God in sorrow as well as in joy. What should be, what should we be thankful for? How about for the fulfilling the needs of life? For the food to feed our families, or for the means to help even the hungry? We should really be thankful for God Himself as our Redeemer and our Savior, and receptive to His will. To become unthankful is to, be, is to become nearsighted, even blind, really, if you think about it. The unthankful person no longer sees God's goodness to him. In time, we will forget that he even needs God, or that God even exists. The price of unthankfulness is very high, folks. We cannot ignore God's rights, God's sovereignty, God's loving kindness, without losing touch with the one on who our very life depends. The thing about it is an unthankful nation is also an unthinking nation, and America's deepest problems come from blindness to the goodness and the power, really, of God. Perhaps we drifted further than we really know. We lost much of our basic trust in God. No longer do we clearly see his wisdom or his power and his love. We put our trust in men. And the thing about it, folks, they're failing. We lay aside the Bible, in our, not only in our schools, but also in our homes and also in our public life as well. Small wonder we lost our concept of sin and our condemnation of wrongdoing. Bloodshed and violence just fill our land. And again and again, we affirm the rights of men at the cost of God's rights. We stole our godly birthright from humanism's pottage. And these are the products of unthankfulness. Where have we missed the way? kind of made that fatal error of thinking that we could be wise and good without God's help. And that's sad. That we can be great and happy and still reject salvation on God's terms. We must turn back and begin to look up really in gratitude. Well, the nine here, did, they just walked away, didn't they? With ingratitude in their hearts. But only one came back. With thankfulness. How's it with you today? Are you really thankful? Can you look up and thank God every day and even sometimes through tears? Are you one of God's thankful people? Jesus Christ came to separate us from our sins. He died on the cross that you and I might know true forgiveness. God's Faithfulness is a blessed comfort, not only in times like this, but for all eternity. Paul tells us, in closing here, I'm reading a thing from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
Have you let Jesus Christ come and do what he came to do? If there's no one here this morning that has, hasn't received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, is in thankfulness, receive God's unspeakable gift. Let's pray. Father, we just looked at many things here this morning. You know what's on our hearts. We can't hide that from you. You know us inside and out. Today I ask, ask Father, that you help us to change our hearts and minds to be a more thankful people, trusting in you as you give us the guidance and the wisdom that, that we need. Father, we just lift up everyone here this morning in praise and thankfulness because you have blessed us beyond measure. Our cup runs over when we're drinking from the saucer of life. Give us a direction that you want us to go, Father, as we take this word, these things that have eternal value, Father, to seal them upon our hearts so we can take them to a lost and dying world. That Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to you but by him. And this I pray in his precious name. Amen.
I'll do it from here. As we receive the benediction today, I'll read from uh, the one from Jude. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.